Okay, so uh, this is a joint work with uh, Justin Lin. Uh, it's very uh, preliminary. Uh, so you, my, my RA today, this morning, sent me in some updated result. Um, so uh, any uh, comments will be highly appreciated. <laughs> of course not. Uh, so, uh, um, well, middle income trap is a kind of controversial concept I mean, in academia. But you know, it starts you know, uh, as basically, you know, say some people in the World Bank you know, describe this term, uh, which refers to the phenomenon that you know, in the year 1960, okay, there are 101 economies classified as middle income countries. But you know, uh, by year at the year 2008, almost 50 years later, only 13 economies sort of successfully graduate from middle income status and, and, and become high income economies. Okay. So close to 90% of econ uh, economies kind of you know, remain to be uh, middle income, uh, remain kind of in, in that category. Okay. So that phenomenon is, is kind of described as middle, middle income trap. Um, so just you now give you a concrete example. This is kind of copy and paste from IMF working paper. So the horizontal axis is the year, uh, how long does the economy reach you know, uh, GDP per capita, the 3,000 US dollars PPP terms. And you see the clearly Taiwan and South Korea, you know, uh, they, 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 they are kind of successful economies. They escape the mid, so-called middle income trap. But many other economies still kind of linger around. And, and, you know, um, and the growth rate is not high. high okay? So, but here, what I try to what what I try to talk about, or what or we can define the middle income trap in a kind of different way. So we really talk about a relative gap. So we're maybe a more accurate term is called the non-convergence trap. So the non-convergence trap for middle income countries. So this is a world income distribution the horizontal axis. You know, uh, is 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 a real GDP per capita relative to the U.S. Okay, so the this is a density. So different colors refer to different years. What I can see from this picture is that world income distribution is relatively stable over years. So you, you, you do see the twin peaks. You know, there are kind of a lot of poor countries concentrated there, and also there are a rich club, OECD countries. But you know, it seems that in the modern growth theory tend to kind of ignore what happens for the middle middle countries. And then it kind of people just think about you know, poor versus rich, but somehow uh, ignore the middle. So the question, the more meaningful question for this whole so kind of middle income trap kind of project is how to think about the different challenges you know, those economies faces as compared to those really kind of low income trap you know, uh, mechanisms. Um, so this is uh, the question we try to look at. And uh, this is a probability transition matrix. You know, uh, so here we can define the middle income trap you know, as uh, those whose GDP per capita, PPP terms, is between 20% uh, and 55% of U.S. category is kind of arbitrary uh, threshold, but this is a criteria used in the literature. So what you see is that, you know, for example, um, this. So this means that you know, the year 1990, uh, there are like 29 economists out of 42 are counted as a middle income country, um, but you know, 20 years later, 70% of them still remain in the middle. Okay, so if you, but you know, it has some probability you know, moving back, some probably moving up, so it's kind of more volatile. And this is kind of low, low income trap, if you like, and this is kind of high persistence of the high income country. And if you use a different kind of data, data set, and uh, you get a similar thing. Of course, this probability depends on how long the time window you look at, but in general, it seems you know, uh, it's interesting to look, look at why the, most of the middle income countries fail to converge to the US. So this is a question we try to, to look at. Um, uh, no much work here. Uh, so I think you know, in order to understand the different kind of a growth rate for different countries, typically we would think, you know, Unhappy families are unhappy for different reasons. Uh, so what we try to do is, you know, we just think about possible different mechanisms. And in today's talk, I try to mainly focus on the role of uh, production service. So here, um, this is mainly a theoretical word at this stage. What we do is we mainly consider structural transformation from uh, manufacturing to service. So basically, we ignore the agriculture part. And what's rather new in this model is that we divide service into production service and consumption service. Okay, and we divide uh, manufacturing into low quality manufacturing, high quality manufacturing. 
So the criteria we use uh, to divide a low quality and high quality manufacturing is by a uh, Eurostat kind of high technology um, classification. And the way how we divide the production service and consumption service is that first we use you know, the master by Paul Antris to construct upstream index. Okay, and then we work on China's import table and also world import table basically and then we uh, you know, that, use that upstream index to see which one is upstream, which one downstream. Okay, and then we kind of you know, look at, just look at different service sectors and you know, those service sectors whose upstream index is about 3.3 .3, and we define as production service. Examples of production services include you know, financial services, uh, including telecommunication, the post services, and transportation, and also uh, other you know, business services like leasing. And also the distribution of water, gas, and electricity. So these are typical examples of production service. And the consumption services you know, like a hotel, restaurants, and entertainment, uh, uh, tours, and etc. These are mainly for con you know, uh, consumption purpose. So it seems you know, if we think about China, this although this model is more general, but if you think about China, uh, it seems to be uh, you know kind of people have reached consensus that you know, China's upstream industries, uh, if you look at the upstream sectors, including the upstream service sectors, these are highly dominated by state of enterprises. In other words, there is a huge entry barrier to the upstream production services. Okay? But the downstream sectors in you know, ser uh, service or manufacturing, uh, both are quite liberalized. Okay, so the entry barrier to the downstream sectors, including consumption service, is relatively low, much lower than the upstream um, services. So in today's talk, we just try to uh, construct a model uh, to show that you know, the, the entry barrier to the production service could be a very important growth binding constraint for middle income countries, but it might not be that binding. It might not be that important for countries at a lower development stage. So the importance of the production service increases as in countries GDP per capita level increases. Okay. So in other words, the policy implication is that if you know the entry barrier to the up upstream production service continue to be that high, that might you know uh, really hurt uh, the you know the probability of convergence for this uh, corresponding uh, middle income country. So this is kind of the key message we try to try to deliver. Okay, and, and here we also show that you know, uh, because of the existence of pecuniary rationality, so the market equilibrium is not necessarily efficient, so there is some potential role for welfare enhancing uh, government intervention. So, uh, okay, so basically you know, we have uh, several cross-country evidence, and for those evidence, you know, we still try to refine all this, the way how we present, but I think this is the, the, the key Idea is basically the four. First, you know, uh, if you look at using the input of a table, you do see that in the production service is more intensively used in a high quality manufacturing and, and in a consumption service as compared to the basic manufacturing. Okay, so in other words, you know, um, if you only produce basic manufacturing, the demand for production service is not that much. Okay. But if you really in a, have structural change to the, the consumption service or you have industrial upgrading uh, from low quality manufacturing to high quality manufacturing, then the demand for the uh, production service will be much larger. Okay. So this is just a fact. Um, and the second, uh, so if you compare those uh, you know, trap, in the, in the low income trap, so we have a definition of how we, met, how we define the country as in this trap in the middle income status versus not trap. Okay, you see, if we compare these two groups, you find that those who escaped the middle income trap, okay, actually they have the production service share is much higher than those still you know, are trapped. So, you know, uh, but when the, the pattern is exactly opposite for low income countries. If, you know, in other words, for those economies who are trapped in the low income status, okay, their production service share is actually higher than those who escaped the low income trap. So the pattern is exactly opposite, okay? So this morning, my, my RA basically, you know, the run of regression, basically how we establish that is, you know, we kind of run, you know, so, so we have the left-hand side is kind of a dummy variable indicating whether it's, it's escaper or it's trap, trapped ones. And then, you know, we have a dumb, you know, sort of like a, sorry, the, um, 
Okay, so we, we, we might come back to that. Basically, we control the income level, and, uh, and, and we see you know, how, how this production service share uh, depend on this you know, dummy variable, whether you are, you, are, um, you, are, you, are, you are you are trapped or not trapped. And, and basically, the facts two or three are both you know, uh, significant. And, and also, the fourth is, you know, is we just look at the correlation between uh, GDP per capita of a country uh, and, and in the production service and the total service, okay? And you see the positive correlation, okay? And in terms of the fact about China, as I mentioned, uh, uh, so uh, China's service sector is actually underdeveloped. I'm gonna show, show you some, some, some facts and, and data. And also China had this vertical structure, meaning that the upstream sectors, including service sectors, are, are highly dominated by SOEs. So they have huge entry barrier. It seems uh, very, possibly that could be a key reason why China's service sector in general is underdeveloped. I don't think I will have enough time to go to all the, the, all the, all the, all the uh, data, but let me do show you. Uh, so here, and just give you a picture of a China structure transformation. So you do see that you know, basically the uh, employment share of service exceeded that of industry at around year 1994, 1995. And, and you know, employment share in service it also exceeded uh, the, you know, uh, agriculture around year 2011. Okay, so in terms of employment or job creations, really, you know, comes from service. Um, but if you compare China's you know, in, uh, service share in total GDP, this is for year 2012, you do see that China is kind of relatively underdeveloped. Okay, uh, in the international perspective. Okay, so. Um, these are the basically uh, facts that indicating why China's upstream sectors have uh, know, uh, are dominated by state of enterprises, so they ha have high entry barrier. But the, the thing we really want to go through is this model, uh, because this is a key thing, uh, uh, the key contribution of, of, of this paper. Um, so in the model part, basically we have an autarky model and have, have trade uh, and have international trade model. And for the autarky part, we first look at the market equilibrium, and also uh, calculate you know, the you know, um, first best allocation. You know, and then we compare the different allocations that help us to think about the possible role for government. So you know, this is a representing household model, general equilibrium, and in each household is endowed with one unit of labor that could be inelastic supply to the market. So we basically, in a, a home sort of a necessary uh, service is, is basically uh, omitted. So it's assumed already there. Okay. Um, so this is a kind of a preference uh, utility function to work with. Uh, so here, this is you know, if you take uh, this as as kind of normalized to one, this is a quasi-linear utility function. So here, the H refers to high quality manufacturing consumption. This S is consumption service. And this B is basic, uh, basic manufacturing. Okay, so here, Ypsilon is price less. This B for CB. For this non-homothetic preference, the advantage of this is that, first of all, you do see that the income effect all gonna fall upon this consumption service and high quality manufacturing. And second, if we normalize the unit to this, to unity, and then basically, you know, the, uh, the eventually, uh, the advantage of this utility function is that you know uh, the, the GDP per capita will be exactly an equivalent uh, to this welfare level. So it helps us to do the welfare analysis. Okay. So this is uh, this is uh, the preference, and you know, the, uh, imagine an economy which has two sectors: one, the traditional sector, just to produce the basic manufacturing; one, this modern sector. Within the modern sector, there is a vertical structure. There is an you know, upstream sort of uh, production service, and 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 there is uh, a downstream sort of you know uh, high quality manufacturing. This is you know uh, goods. Uh, imagine this is iPhone, and also uh, consumption service. Okay. So here, uh, technology is uh, assuming that all the technology is constant return of scale. Um, and you know, here, just you know, to b produce basic manufacturing, assume that only labor needed. So you know, we, we basically, you know, it does not require um, a production service. Um, uh, this is just the simplification, because you know, the, the data do show that you know, the this demand for uh, production service from basic manufacturing much lower than the other two. Okay, so to produce high quality manufacturing or to produce consumption service, it needs both M, which refers to the production service, and this labor. Okay. 
So this is, uh, this is a setting. And now for this upstream production service, imagine that there are N uh, firms and producing differentiated sort of in the production service. And there's a monopsy competition. And each firm, they need to pay this uh, fixed cost F in terms of labor, just like a Krugman setting. And, and eventually, uh, the, the firm number N is endogenously determined. So in terms of market structure, except for the production service, uh, uh, which has been up to competition. All the other markets are perfect competitive. Okay. Uh, how many minutes do I have? Okay, on the 21st. Okay, great. Right. Um, so, well, first of all, basically it shows that you know, if the entry barrier, remember F is entry cost to the upstream sector. If the, if the entry cost is very large, then you know, just no firms would uh, enter the production service. So the production service uh, output is zero, and therefore the, the downstream high quality manufacturing output is also zero, consumption service is zero. So there is no structural change or structural industrial upgrading. Here, by industrial upgrading, I refer to specifically you know, uh, the, the upgrading from the basic manufacturing to high manufacturing within the manufacturing sector. When I say structural change, I mean uh, the labor reallocation from manufacturing to service. Um, so if you know there is no kind of industrial upgrading or structural change, then you know the only the basic manufacturing will be produced. So so then basically this W is the wage rate, and it's also GDP per capita. Okay, the same thing, and it is just you know uh, because of the utility function is equal to the welfare level. This is an increasing function of the labor productivity in the basic manufacturing. Okay, so this is kind of. Uh, so what's more interesting is that uh, suppose you know the entry cost to the production service is sufficiently low, then what you're going to see, they're going to see multiple market equilibrium. They're going to see high market equilibrium and low market equilibrium. The reason why we want to construct a model that have multiple equilibrium is because we want to see, we hope the model can yield uh, the, the result that in some cases you have some premature in the structural change as we compare low income trap uh, with those who escape low income trap. And in some cases, you might have delayed you know, structural change. Okay. So uh, this N is the, the equilibrium number of firms that enters the option production service. So just in the visually, you know, look at this. You know, the horizontal axis is the number of firms. Okay. So the crossing point is the equilibrium number of firms with production service that co correspond to the two different market equilibrium. So the more the uh, if the more firm entry to the production service, the necess that will imply higher GDP, higher welfare, just in a more efficient allocation. Okay. So here the reason why we have multiple equilibrium uh, is because you know essentially you know you because you have the fixed entry cost, you have kind of increasing return to scale production function. So eventually you, you have this multiple equilibrium. Okay. Um, but what's interesting is that actually you know not the so if we compare uh, the, uh, the welfare or the GDP of the market equilibrium uh, with another allocation in which we put all the labor to the basic manufacturing sector, okay? and we compare these two, you find that only when the equilibrium number of firms exceeds this n hat, then the market equilibrium is more efficient than this I uh, know. Uh, then this allocation, with, which in which you know all the labor just you know, works in the basic manufacturing. In other words, no structural tran transformation, no industrial upgrading would be better in, in in terms of efficiency or welfare than the market equilibrium with uh, structural change. Okay. So here, let me just you know, give you an example. Okay. Now. So you know, before the change, this is you know we have two equilibrium: the high equilibrium and the low equilibrium. We're going to focus on the high equilibrium. Okay. So this n hat, because high equilibrium is like the n hat, meaning that this market equilibrium is indeed better than this no structural change allocation. So it is good. But you know, if say you know the basic manufacturing productivity increases, here we all do the comparative analysis. Or you know these other productivities decreases, then the curve going to shift down downward. So the high equilibrium is going to move to this n two prime, but it says n hat does not change. So in other words, after the change, uh, basically in a, although those two market equilibrium both have structural change and industrial upgrading, but actually these are all 
premature because they're, they're actually less efficient in than this no industrial upgrading. upgrading. Okay, so this is a case in which we, you have premature industrial upgrading. Okay. Um, and here, the reason why you, know, you have this inefficiency in the market, uh, market equilibrium, not only because you have this sort of entry cost, but also there is a pecuniary externality out there. You know, think about you, know, you are a potential uh, investor, okay, a firm in option production service. Okay. You just, you, when you decide whether to enter that production service or not, you do not really consider the potential impact on the other downstream sectors in this input output linkage. Okay. So you, you just think about your own return. Okay. But you know, if more investors become you know, you know, optimistic, they enter the production service sector, then they will drive down the production service prices that will lower the price of consumption service high quality manufacturing. Okay. And then all the income effect, okay, gonna all falls upon those consumption service and high quality manufacturing. So that will basically reinforce that equilibrium. So that, you know, indeed an equilibrium, so a lot of people are rushing in, okay. But it is not that efficient. Okay, here this is different from you know, like a big push model by you know, uh, Murphy, Schleif, or Wishney. There they do not really think about the structural change. And, and there you know, uh, it is always good to kind of push and have kind of a shift in the technology. But here you, know, you might have the market equilibrium might induce too early you know, structural change in industrial grading. In some other cases it might induce kind of delayed industrial grading. So both are, are dangerous, sort of, from the welfare point of view. And therefore, you know, uh, in terms of a policy implication, for if the government has to choose between these two different market equilibrium, he would, 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 would like to coordinate to the high equilibrium. Okay, so that is kind of straightforward. But we also see that, you know, since you know, the industrial upgrading and the structural change might be premature, might be delayed, so you might think about the potential you know, deregulation or regulation of, uh, by the mar uh, by the um, by the government, um, but you know you, you could compute this artificial social plan problem. So this is the efficient allocation. Okay, so what's what's nice is that we can solve up everything. Um, so basically, you know the the and this this parity efficient allocation is different from the, these two market equilibrium. So that you know provide us a guidance to where the the best allocation should be and how the how the government should do. Um, this is just to show you, uh, this is a mess, uh, but this is just to show you that you know, the comparostatic analysis uh, for the market equilibrium, which are testable, okay, uh, there is kind of different for the comparostatic results for the parity efficient allocation. Okay, for example, in the market equilibrium, okay, if we increase the productivity, uh, then tend to you know, increase the entry in the upstream production service and also increase the upstream production service output. Okay, so that is, that is kind of fairly intuitive. But if you look at the parity efficient allocation, you know, this is the parity efficient allocation, you see you know, it is not necessarily the case. Okay. So, so you know, um, I could say a lot about the implication of that, but you know, this is just tell us you know, at the market equilibrium is not efficient and we need to think about uh, how, the implications of, of the productivity increase in different sectors and in, in terms of, um, also in terms of an entry cost um, here F, okay? So, so this is basically, you know, the, as I mentioned, the, the role for government to, to rectify the, the inefficiency uh, of the market equilibrium, you know, you have different, these, these kind of different possible ways. But now let me, uh, move on to this uh, trade equilibrium, okay? Um, maybe I'm going too fast, or, but, but I think you know, here the, the key message is that uh, because you, know, you have this input of linkages between the production service and the downstream sectors, and, and so the structural change gonna, gonna basically induce by the income effect, gonna, gonna kind of favor all those, you know, uh, uh, Production service. So in some cases, it, it will lead to premature you know, structural change in industrial grading. Okay. But uh, and also, be, but on the other hand, because there exists an uh, entry barrier, so there might you might have delayed okay, structural change in industrial grading. It really depends on the parameters. Okay. So and and the, the market equilibrium not not necessarily uh, efficient. 
So now we want to move to, to trade. The reason why I want to move to trade is because here uh, we think in you know, service and manufacturing, they are different in tradability. Okay. So here in this model, I just simply assume that the you know, services are not tradable and the manufacturing are tradable. So in the openness to trade, it's gonna have asymmetric impact on different sectors, and it has, you know, uh, it will have different impact on industrial grading and, um, and the structural change. So imagine the two countries, you know, H and, and F, home country exactly the economy that we mentioned earlier. This is kind of middle income country, and there is a developing country called F. So this is a general equilibrium kind of trade. Um, so I'm going to ask right away, because we're going to mainly focus on the convergence, divergence between these two, and focus on the, the country H. So we want to make the country F as simple as possible. We have to right away all those kind of vertical structure thing in this foreign country. Okay? Uh, and, and this is a free trade. Um, I guess let me just try to select the results that I want to highlight most. Okay. So now it really depends on it really depends on the equilibrium uh, trade pattern. So here, W star is GDP per capita of the foreign country, and W is GDP per capita of the home country. So here, what we, we care about is this ratio. Okay, so because we think about the middle and travel, we want to think about the relative income levels. So uh, you know, if this ratio increases, it means divergence. If it, if if it is being smaller, it convergence. So we want to see how this ratio depends on all the other exogenous parameters. Okay, uh, this is just comparison analysis. Okay, now it, in the case in the uh, in this particular case, when this home country and F country are completely specialized, the home country only you know export uh, and and produce the basic manufacturing. And the foreign country is going to produce and export basic, you know, a high quality manufacturing. In that particular case, you know, what, what's kind of interesting is that if you increase, if you increase entry barrier to production service, actually that will, uh, will help reduce the gap. Uh, well, that, that will um, help reduce the back. The, the intuition is that, you know, Consider, so the high quality manufacturing like iPhone, okay? And it's about the consumption service as, as in a Wi-Fi service, okay? So if, if China has provides a better Wi-Fi service because of a lower entry barrier, okay, that will increase the marginal utility for the, for the iPhone, which is you know, imported from, from abroad. Remember, in the utility function, consumption service, the high quality manufacturing are complementary. So in that case, actually, when you when increase the, you know, uh, the the production of a consumption service that will induce more imports, and hence that will enlarge the gap. Okay, um, but if uh, let's focus on the, this case, if in you know, a home country not only in you know, a produce basic manufacturing, but also start producing high quality manufacturing, but the foreign country only produce in you know, a high quality manufacturing. Sorry, this is a type. This should be smaller one. Then in that case. You know, if you increase entry barrier, okay, F, okay, in the home country's production service, that will enlarge the gap. In other words, it helps to it helps to reduce the entry barrier, reduce F, so that it can you know have a convergence. So this is a situation in which you know um, high entry barrier really hurts, so the the, the odds of catching up. Okay, so. Um, this basis uh, you know, depends on the different trade equilibrium, which is endogenous, and then you know, the, the uh, reduction of entry barrier to production service might have totally opposite implications for this convergence uh, uh, divergence result. Okay. So this is, a, this is a kind of a, the, the, the main message. So let me just conclude. Okay, so what we do here is uh, in order to try to understand the sort of a non-convergence phenomenon for the country, the middle-income status. Okay, so we try we build a model that try to highlight the importance of the production service and, and in particular the entry barrier to production service. This F. Okay, so in the model, you know, so we make the distinction between the production service and the consumption service. 
and also we, we think about you know manufacturing sector itself, you know, whether the industrial upgrading from low quality manufacturing to high quality manufacturing is efficient, is premature, or is too delayed. Okay, so the market equilibrium could go both ways. Okay, so, so that's why I think you know, uh, 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 it's, I think it's important to really think about uh, these two possibilities and a possible role for government. Um, so we show in this model, we show, I just, I'm just repeating myself, we show that you know, the high entry barriers to production service sectors might not hamper the output at the low income level because of the, because of the production structure at that time is just to produce basic manufacturing, which does not require too much you know, uh, upstream production service. But it would be the key obstacles for economies in the middle income countries, which really you know, moved into the you know, consumption sector and also move it to the high quality manufacturing. But these sectors would require more intensively uh, the production service as intermediate inputs. Okay. So at that stage, if the entry barrier to production service is still high enough, that would hurt this industrial upgrading. Okay. And also, in, in, some, in some cases, because of the possible coordination failure problem and because of this internal pecuniary externality, the market equilibrium is not efficient. So, so that, that's why we have to think about uh, uh, the role uh, for government. And in terms of trade, uh, the trade could, you know, uh, so I, I kind of you know, skipped that slide, but, but if we allow for, you know, borrowing lending, then, you know, in, so for a country like China, you know, at the early stage, it just export quite a lot, okay, but, you know, has accumulated a lot of trade surplus. Okay. So that will increase the income of, of, of Chinese people. That will help you know, uh, increase the demand for high quality manufacturing and increase the demand for consumption service from the uh, uh, you know, uh, income effect point of view. So that will, so in that sense, international trade might help facilitate the industrial upgrading okay, and the structural change. But it could be inefficient in some cases. So we have to be cautious. So uh, just let me stop here. Okay. Right. it? Uh, I'm going to apologize because uh, Yong said that uh, most of the contribution of the paper is theoretical. Half the slides were empirical, half the slides were theoretical, and I focused mostly on the empirical in the discussion. Um, I like the, the big picture question is uh, sort of motivated by the fact that, I call it a middle income trap. Yong said it was a controversial term, I thought it was just a bad term. But I think that the idea is right, which is that you know, countries, even after they reach something like $3,000 per capita, experience very different growth patterns over time. And I think there's kind of a, a question about can structural change patterns, basically failure to move into production services, can they explain these patterns? And that's kind of what this paper is about and what, how can policy affect these structural change patterns. So I saw two contributions. I saw an empirical contribution. Um, uh, focusing on structural change, they, t they, they note that production services become more important over development, and then the recent uh, results are that those are linked to the growing countries. And then using the input-output data, they show that consumption services are intensive in production services. And I thought those were both um, uh, quite interesting. Um, and then from the, th the theory side, they have this model where the, um, the social planners, uh, the, the Pareto efficient allocation doesn't correspond to the market um, equilibria. There's multiple market equilibria that we can Pareto rank. Uh, so that kind of opens up the door for policy. And so they, it leads room for industrial policy. I just thought that was interesting. Uh, let me go talk a little bit about the big picture. I think there's a question about is structural change maybe a better indicator for development or maybe a leading indicator for future development? Is, is it better than GDP per capita? And I think that's a very nice question. I, this reminded me of a few papers. One is this paper about stop-start growth by Jones and Oaken, where countries experience uh, um, periods of very high growth followed by periods of very low growth. Also reminded me of a paper that I don't think ever got published by Chari, uh, Keogh, and McGratton from the 1990s, where they basically thought of all countries growing in this distribution of 2% per year, 
And then changes in policies basically telling you whether you moved up in the distribution or down in the distribution. But those were largely transitional phenomenon because it was a neoclassical model. Um, I think a lot of countries, you can think of uh, income per capita, this getting to $3,000 uh, uh, per person. You know, this could be driven by raw materials, could be driven by terms of trade-led growth. Countries like Kuwait, Kuwait's very high in terms of income per capita. But we don't, I wouldn't think we think of that as a developed country in the same way we would think of the United States or Western Europe or, or uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and, oh, sorry. And then Venezuela, which, you know, when, when oil prices are high, it's doing quite well. Chile, the question now in Chile is how much of their uh, growth has been driven by copper prices. Um, and this idea of, of sort of, I don't know, it reminded me of this, these papers about diversification and growth. Hausman has a series, of, Ricardo Hausman has a series of papers. There's this paper with Corn and Tenrero linking diversification and growth. So I think that's a, an interesting question, in, in, in particular because the patterns of structural change are so, so salient uh, with development. Uh, so then the empirical stuff, the first thing is I, these were totally new terms to me. So these guys have a, it's basically a new idea on classifying sectors, which is potentially interesting. Um, they look at, they call this consumption basic manufacturing, and it's low tech manufacturing that's downstream. So the consumption refers to downstream. Consumption high quality manufacturing, which is basically high tech manufacturing, which is downstream. I don't know exactly how either of those are measured, but apparently the paper is kind of borrowing that, those measurements from others. Then they have production manufacturing, which is upstream. Consumption services, which is downstream. And then the focus of the paper really is this production services, which are upstream, upstream services. And then what does this basically boil down to in terms of industries that we know? It's utilities, transportation, communication, finance, and business services. Um, OK. So then I had a question about whether these patterns, the structural change, is basically just capturing skill-intensive services, in part because I have a paper on this, but, but that's, that's how I started thinking about this. Uh, typically, if you want to define different sectors, we differenti differentiate sectors that either differ in their produc production technologies or in their demand patterns, because if they're the identical in their production technology or identical in their demand patterns, then we have aggregation results that tell us we shouldn't really care about these sectors separately. Um, and so um, with these guys, with production services, they show that production services grow. So that's something about the demand pattern. And uh, uh, service consumption is in, uh, consumption services are intensive in production services. So cons service consumption looks different in other sectors and that they're, it's intensive in, um, intensive in these production services. Um, I think, again, now I have this question about this being skill intensive services. When you look at the patterns that they identify, both the intensity of service consumption and production services is largely driven by finance and business service, and the growth is driven by finance and business services, not by uh, transportation. Um, uh, communication and um, utilities. And the, the difference between those two is, of course, that the finance and business services are much more skill intensive. Um, I like this idea because it's a, a sort of a nice link where we, if we put in something in preferences, not in terms of value added, but in terms of final expenditures, we get, pe we get people consuming more uh, consumption services, we get an increase, an endogenous increase in demand for these service intermediates. I thought that was kind of neat. It's a, um, and then um, I mentioned I said that this is you know, basically driven by finance and business services. So then I had this question, is this just skill intensity? And I'm going to advertise my paper for a couple seconds here with uh, Paco and Richard. Uh, is it just skill by a structural change? This is, a, this is data for the OECD countries, basically. This is the share of labor going to high skilled, share of labor payments going to high skilled workers for different sectors. And this is what we call the, the skill intensive sector. Now it rises over time, but it's always much more than these other sectors. These are sort of skill intensive manufacturing sectors. And then the, the, the rest of the services in manufacturing are sort of low skill. If we look at the um, structural change patterns, oh, it's amazing how salient these are. 
So this is the high skill sectors. Now the high skill sectors contains finance and business services, but it also contains healthcare and education. The first two are intermediates, the, last, the second two are largely uh, you know, final consumption. But you just see these, all these countries are lining up. You know, 80% of the variation explained by GDP per capita. So this is a very salient development pattern. And I think a nice thing would be to see what's the relationship between these two. If we break this down by, uh, well, this is the relative price of, of, those, of that sector. And you can see also a really nice, tight relationship. The red dots are the US. The green dots are all the other countries. This is if we want to break it down by manufacturing and services. I, I wanted to see that these, uh, that these intermediate services are distinct from high skill services. Another question is whether the high skill services are distinct from just manufacturing services. And this is within uh, manufacturing. And you see that the low skill goods are going down, whereas the, the uh, high skill goods are flat. So there's a movement within the sectors contracting, but the share of high skill intensive stuff is growing within the sector. And the same thing's happening in services. The sector's growing in services, but the skill intensity of the sector is growing. OK. This is just uh, one other thing which is showing you that there's a non-homothaticity. Timo also has some work on this. If you look at cross-sectional data, you'll see a non-homothaticity toward value added in the high skill intensive sector. So that, that seems to be a, like a common structural change pattern. Lastly, I don't know, if I'm out of time, how much time do I have? Two or three minutes over? Sorry. This is, and this is the stuff he said is most important, so let me, okay, sorry. I, I really like the insult. I thought they were very intriguing. I had no idea where they were coming from. I had no idea of the intuition. Uh, the, the, you have uh, two things I can see. You have, a, you have monopolistic competition in pricing, and you have fixed costs. But we have that in, we have that in a Mellitz model. There's nothing inefficient in a Mellitz model. So I was thinking about the, I was thinking about Murphy, Schleifer, and Vishny, and I couldn't make any sense. But I actually realized I think what this is going on is that this is basically like their, their model with a transportation sector, because the pecuniary externality matters because it's an intermediate into the other sector, and then pecuniary pecuniary externalities matter when the when you're not at the first best. Pecuniary externalities can actually affect things. But I think you got to flesh out the intuition on that. The other, uh, yeah, that's it, I guess. I don't know whether, because uh, Park, um, Joe seems to say you, you have the intermediate good, but in your presentation, I think it's only intermediate services, right? So the way I, I, I see the mechanism is just to do with intermediates. So I don't know how much was it goods versus services, and do you have intermediate goods in it? Is it because in the data, the intermediate goods doesn't have that kind of pattern you documented for the intermediate service? Yeah, so I just wanted to know. Why don't you respond? In fact, we have a little bit over time as well. Yeah, where are you? <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'd really like to thank uh, Joe for taking this really uh, tough job because I have no draft. You just, you had to guess what I tried to say from all the slides. Um, um, but, you know, um, yeah, so here, uh, the first one, I just tried to clarify the intuition for the results. Um, so here, uh, that, I guess, you know, if we compare uh, our mechanism with a model by uh, Sh uh, Schleif uh, Wishney, the, their kind of JPE paper, in their paper, you know, there's, there are several important distinctions. First of all, in that paper, they, they think about switch technologies that produce exactly the same good, just whether they're higher, uh, you know, higher productivity or low productivity. There is no structural change or there's no kind of input opt input optic linkage between different sectors. Um, so this is one kind of a, a difference. So for their model, it's always socially efficient to switch to the, the, the good technology. So here, which, which, which sector should it go to really depends on development stage and depend on you know, all those kind of structural change literature impl implications. Um, and, and the reason why we have this model equilibrium is 
again, this is there is a strategic strategic complementarity out there. So if 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 you have more entry, basically that will that will uh, in, de, and a decrease the price of the consumption service, high quality manufacturing. That will, that will increase you know, the income effect. Will what goes again together hand in hand with the substitution factor will in, in, induce demand for that sector. So that kind of self self enforced. Um, um, and and okay, so and yeah, so and a very nice suggestion about the skill bias structure change. I, I would like to check, but it seems that from your kind of and a slide that shows you may not look at the uh, developed countries. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that if you also incorporate d developing countries, how would the pattern uh, change? And also uh, maybe conceptually, and you know, one way to think about to incorporate the skill bias is just to think about and you know, how to interpret the labor productivity. Um, but I completely agree with you. This is a very interesting way to 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 look at it. Now come back to the Rachel's question. Yeah, very good point. So uh, uh, so in a model. Uh, we do not explicitly in, incorporate this uh, intermediate, uh, intermediate production uh, manufacturing. So in a model, current models, you know, this is kind of just the terminology thing. So it, it actually combines both. But but uh, uh, so this is something that we are working on because I have another paper in the state capitalism, which was uh, joined with the show who sits here. Uh, this is mainly about what happens within the manufacturing sector. So I think you know, what you say it is a make quantitative eventually, we need to take that into account. But qualitative, we think what's more serious in China is really about the production service entry barrier, uh, which might be even more important. But this is purely kind of conjecture.